but then you also have supply issues that have happened over time. And all of this together, along with higher taxes and higher regulations that restrict the amount of supply in the economy, both labor and capital, have pushed prices up higher than otherwise. And even if you look at core inflation running at 3.5%, nearly it's 75% faster than the, what the Federal Reserve would like for it to be, you're still seeing that Americans are not able to keep up. Yes, their earnings are up over year, um, year over year, but if you adjust it for inflation... Hello, welcome to this week's economy. I'm your host, Dr. Vance Gann. Thank you for joining me today. Today is December 7th, 2023. Got a lot to talk about, so let's get right to it. What is the top issue that Americans are worried about? Well, you might have guessed it. It's the economy. In fact, according to a new CNN poll, so this is from CNN, guys, in August of 2020, there were 58% were worried about the state of the economy, 41% that were not worried. You remember, that was during the shutdowns and everything else. Also, people were getting a lot of handouts and other money in their, in their pockets, even if they had lost their job for a while or at least put off from their job for a little while. But now, in November of 2023, 84%. 84% of Americans are worried about the state of the economy and so-called a strong economy, quote air quotes around that, strong economy. Many people are saying that it's a strong economy, including President Biden and many on X.com and other talking heads have tried to say this is a strong economy. Look at the labor market. Look how low the unemployment rate is and all these other things. But that's not how people are really feeling about this. In fact, only 16% are not worried about the economy. So it's a very small share of the American population who feel like they're not worried about it. So there is a lot of fear. There is a lot of uncertainty that's going on. And we're seeing that. And this is another, another poll that shows evidence of that. I've been bringing that to you every week. And we'll continue to do that. The most important issue is the economy. 42% say that. Border security is second at 11%. And foreign policy national security is 10%. So in fact, almost four times more as a share of the, of the population of the polling here anyway, of 42%, more than the second highest at 11%. So there's a lot of worry about the economy. That's why I've been talking about it a lot because there is a lot of things to be concerned about. And we've got to make sure that we continue to, to highlight this because we've got to get out of this. We need better public policy at being a part of that. The latest data show that Americans are getting crushed under Bidenomics. Uh, and it's not your fault as the Atlantic tries to claim. There's a piece in the Atlantic that says it's your fault that inflation is happening. Why are you going out and spending all this money? You know, your demand is increasing faster than supply. And so therefore you're the problem. And it, the issue with this is, is it doesn't understand economics. It's one of those things where tell me you don't understand economics by it without telling me. This is another example of that. Because remember, prices are determined in the price system that's out there in the market process by supply and demand not just demand. And so people have all this money because we have the Fed printing a lot of money. People are gaining incomes. But then you also have supply issues that have happened over time. And all this together, along with higher taxes and higher regulations that restrict the amount of supply in the economy, both labor and capital, have pushed prices up higher than otherwise. And even if you look at core inflation running at 3.5%, nearly it's 75% faster than what the Federal Reserve would like for it to be, you're still seeing that Americans are not able to keep up. Yes, their earnings are up over year, um, year over year, but if you adjust it for inflation, they're about flat. And nearly every month in the, under the Biden administration, we have had declining real wages, meaning in wages, average weekly earnings divided by or, or adjusted for inflation, you get this amount of, of declining real wages. It's not a good situation where people just feel like they can't keep up. And it's unfortunate, but it's a direct result of the bad public policies that have been out of D.C. States and local governments haven't been helping a whole lot in some cases. They have more regulations, housing, zoning issues, and everything else. They should be cutting taxes. Remember, 25 states in the last three years have cut taxes. That's a way to get more money in people's pockets and allow for more economic growth. And in, and in fact, I'll talk about that in a minute, but state GDP has also been increasing in a lot of the states. I'm also glad to see that my tweet about job creation under Biden being bogus was made a community note on x.com. And in fact, there was this discussion, right, between Governor Newsom from California and Governor DeSantis. They had a debate recently on Fox News um, that was moderated by Sean Hannity. And, and, you know, Governor Newsom made this case that Bidenomics has created all these jobs and everything else, and 14 million jobs have been added under the Biden administration. But that's not all the story, okay? What I talked about was there have been 13 million private sector jobs added since January of 2021 when Biden took office. So I excluded out 
the government jobs is about a million, okay? Because productive jobs are the private economy. But most of those were just restoring the jobs lost from the destructive shutdowns, which Biden and Newsom supported and wanted longer and more restrictive. So it'd be even worse. DeSantis shouldn't have shut down Florida as there are major consequences from that, but at least he was wise up and opened up more quickly than a lot of other states. Accurately accounting new jobs since February of 2020, before the shutdowns, there have been 4.5 4.5 million new private sector jobs in nearly three years during the Biden administration. So it's not 14 million, it's 4.5 million. So a little over a million jobs a year. That's certainly not the most out of any other presidents that are out there. And so this was a bogus claim. I'm glad that X.com put that community note on there based on my tweet. Another thing is, is that we need to say no to a carbon tariff, right? There's no need for a carbon tax. Carbon dioxide is something that is necessary for life on our planet. I'm breathing out right now. You are too, if you're alive. And we've got to have a, a way to make sure that we don't have this climate cult, this religion that people are going on and trying to take more control over our lives and over the economy, that this cannot happen. We don't need tariffs in general. We need more free trade, lower government spending, lower corporate taxes that allow for more job creation here in America. And if we do that and we focus more on natural gas, nuclear would also be a great thing to do that would set us in a good position not only for a more robust productive economy but also if, if you want to look at carbon dioxide emissions that's the way you bring them down and they have been going down the united states compared to a lot of other places so we've got to get away from this idea about a carbon tax or a carbon tariff or anything along those lines so what's up with the states state gdp for 2023 and q2 was just recently released by the u.s bureau of economic analysis and what it shows is that the number one state you ready was wyoming plus 8.7 percent on an annual basis in the second quarter kansas was number two at 7.4 percent nebraska number three at 5.9 percent texas number four at 4.9 percent and alaska was 4.8 percent to round out the top five other states right or number 10 was louisiana plus 3.2 percent Number 13 was California at plus 2.8%, Florida plus 2.3%, number 20. And then you have to go down to the bottom, New York, another one of the large states, with number 42 at plus 0.4%. And the last was, was Vermont, negative 1.9%. In fact, the, the, the six states at the bottom all had declining real GDP. Missouri, Wisconsin, Arkansas, Delaware, Mississippi, and Vermont all had declining GDP in the second quarter. So this is not a good sign there. And we're probably going to have more slowdown in the economy. I've seen job creation that I've talked about recently has also started to contract in many states. So that's something to look at. One thing I did mention about in this debate between DeSantis and Newsom was just how much that Florida is kicking the butt out of California when it comes to public policy, when it comes with good government policies of lower government spending, lower taxes, and less regulation. And that's contributed to lower cost of living, better economic performance, and better economic measures, including lower supplemental poverty rate, 13.2% in California and a 12.7% in Florida. So across the board, California has doing is doing worse than in Florida. And that's why I think we need to be looking at these policies like in Florida, like in Texas and some other places. They need to get things right in other areas. Don't get me wrong. There are ways for improvement, but there's a lot they're getting right. And I'll put this in the under the paywall. Remember, if you can go out and get a paid subscription now to my newsletter at advancedgain.substack.com, because that's where I'm putting a lot of these charts and everything instead of from the quote unquote free portion of it. I hope you'll really enjoy all that information. Texas, Texas ended a special session without school choice and likely for the best. I had a piece out recently in the center square talking about this. And look, I think that's the best thing for Texas to do. I think Governor Abbott should rest for a while and say, you know what, I'm going to go after those who are against school choice in the primaries and during the regular general election and come back in January of 2025 and get a robust, the best school choice bill, universal school choice where everyone who wants it can get it and has the funding available to do it and not keep pumping more money into the, the failing monopoly government school system. So that's the way it should happen there. Texas Comptroller Glenn Hager also had a piece out recently saying, look, we're going to have a lot of money in the rainy day fund in Texas, about $20 billion to be exact. Um, I had I tweeted about this and said, look, you know, it, it, this seems like too much. These are productive dollars from the private sector that should be in the productive private sector. Why not cut severance taxes, sales taxes, property taxes, something else to give money back to the people in the economy instead of bringing in so much? I mean, in fact, some of my research shows that instead of having a 10 percent cap on the rainy day fund amount based on certain general revenue, it should be closer to 7 percent, if not less. 
we've really got to not have so much money in these funds and instead should be in the productive private sector. Some personal notes that I had out recently, I went to the Mint, Mint for More Summit by American Enterprise Institute and Alliance for Opportunity in Washington, D.C. to hear presentations about alleviating poverty. One way is the success sequence, where I'm going to put some information under the paywall about that. Uh, but basically, you need to get education, get a job, and get married before you have kids in that order. And you're more, you're more likely to be out of poverty. In fact, Research shows 97% chance of not being in poverty if you follow that order. So that's a great way to do it. You know, I'm, I'm also going to be talking about reviews. If you give me reviews on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, you're going to be access to the link that's in the show notes page of going on there, putting information, and you'll be added to the raffle, really, of winning um, a book this time. The current winner for this week goes to Jennifer Gross. Thank you, Jennifer, for your review on Apple Podcasts. You will get a paid subscription to my Substack newsletter. So I hope you'll enjoy that. But I'm also going to be giving out a, a, a book here soon. I'll have more information about what that book is going to be. But go and provide a review that really helps me get more hits and, and provide this information to more people. The past Let People, people Prosper episode on Monday was with Dr. Gail Pooley on Superabundance. Don't miss that. And the upcoming Let People Prosper episode on this coming Monday will be with Jennifer Huddleston on the problems with regulating technology. So with all that said, the, the quote of the week was complete free trade is not politically feasible. Why? Because it's only in the general interest and no one's special interest by Milton Friedman. That's what we need, though, is free trade. We shouldn't be worried about these things overall. We should be doing what's best in the interest of America and also the globe. And I think that comes through free trade. I'll put more of my thoughts there in the show notes page under the paid subscription. And finally, the Bible verse of the day, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Isaiah 40, 31. So with that, friends, until next time, let people prosper. <laughs>